Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. Can you all hear me? The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Uh, during the last few days, uh, uh, we have concentrated on different schools of yoga. And uh, we saw that uh, Hatha Yoga prepares the basic material instrument for better performance. And uh, that means that uh, not only we can use the body better, but we can also stay healthy. And if we do fall sick, we'll recover much faster and more completely. Raja Yoga, on the other hand, prepares the mental part of the instrument. And uh, if we use the technique of meditation as uh, suggested by the Ashtanga, we'll be able to be more at peace. We'll be able to think more clearly and uh, rationally and uh, much better than we normally do. And along with that, Raja Yoga also gives us a basic code of uh, moral purification and uh, guidance for living life along ethical lines. But uh, we did not uh, favor very much going to the extremes that are possible in Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga because that could take away all the time and then uh, what use it would be to have such a perfect instrument but to not be able to use it in everyday life. The Yoga of the Gita on the other hand does not tell us much about how the instrument can be perfected but rather tells us how this instrument can be applied in everyday life. This instrument that uh, we might have improved upon by using the various uh, techniques available in other schools of yoga, how we can use that instrument uh, in everyday life. So the emphasis here is on bringing yoga into our uh, ordinary daily lives and uh, uh, that's the one way one, one, one can look at the yoga of the Gita. So with that uh, I'll now go to the uh, slides. My pranams to the mother and Sri Aurobindo. The Yes Point Oven course uh, in which these days we are doing the schools of yoga is a part of the celebrations of the 150th birth anniversary of Sri and the 75th anniversary of India's independence. So today's uh, session is on uh, yoga of the Gita. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with the Gita but uh, for those who may not be the Gita the full name is Srimad Bhagavad Gita and it's generally called just the Gita and literally Bhagavad Gita means God's song, a song sung by God himself and uh, what uh, it is, the narration is, is uh, the lesson given by the divine teacher Sri Krishna who is an incarnation of God. So God himself is giving a lesson to a human disciple. The human disciple is Arjuna. Arjuna is uh, a highly accomplished man, a leader of uh, people uh, and uh, well read in the various uh, uh, codes of conduct and also a meticulous follower of those codes of conduct. His life has by and large been guided by what he was expected to do in terms of what uh, a good person, an ideal person should be doing. So that is what had guided his life. So here is this highly accomplished person who is in a state of moral crisis and uh, the divine teacher gives him a lesson. And how did he reach that state of a crisis? That crisis was reached in the battlefield. 
So in this battlefield, Arjun is there with Krishna as his charioteer. And uh, when he finds that uh, this battle that he is going to fight may lead to the killing of uh, many near and dear ones, close relatives, even his teacher, he is in a state of dilemma. And uh, he wants to know why I should fight this battle and I don't feel like doing it. I do not want anything. I might get a kingdom if I win the war, but I don't want that kingdom. And uh, he is ready to just lay down his arms and say that I will not fight. But then uh, since Sri Krishna is there, uh, he tells him why he should fight, not for the sake of the kingdom, but uh, because as uh, a person of the warrior class, Kshatriya, it is his duty to defend justice from injustice. Since an injustice has been done by the opponents and uh, all other options for uh, getting justice done have been exhausted, now there is no other option but to fight the war and irrespective of the outcome, without any hatred for the enemies, you pick up the arms and fight this battle. So that is what essentially it is and uh, the Gita has 18 chapters and uh, 700 verses in that in those 18 chapters are the 700 verses of the Gita. The Gita is uh, looked upon more often as a scripture rather than as a textbook of yoga. But then it is not just a scripture, it is also a textbook of yoga and uh, that is how we shall look at it. No matter how we look at it, the Gita has a universal appeal. We will not get into the debate which of the two is uh, more widely translated, but uh, the fact is that uh, the Gita and the Bible are the two most widely translated books in the world. Why the Gita has such a universal appeal is for a variety of reasons. Firstly, it is a rather small book, just 700 verses and uh, if we were to print only the verses or even their verses and uh, a literal translation in some other language, it forms just a pocket book and just to show how small it is perhaps, some people have brought it out in editions which are even much smaller than a pocket book. Further, it is a student friendly book and how it is that we shall take up in a while a little later but briefly uh, it is student friendly because uh, it uh, starts from the simple to the complex and gives the student a lot of freedom about uh, what to do and uh, how to start on the path of yoga. Further the context is that of a story. As I told you this story uh, is about uh, a war and uh, when uh, we learn something through a story, we find it more interesting and it lasts longer. So storytelling is a very effective way of driving home, imp driving home important lessons, much more effective than abstract philosophy. Then further the plot. The plot is a dilemma, a dilemma which a highly accomplished man has who so far has successfully guided his life based on sound ethical principles, but now he is in a state of conflict, he can't decide whether or not to fight and uh, we all have problems in life, different types of dilemmas. So when a person looks at uh, that, the person feels, well, uh, Arjuna got uh, a solution to his dilemma in this book, maybe I'll also find a solution to my problems. So people often turn to the Gita when they are in a state of crisis when they have a problem, when they have a conflict in life, that is when they turn to the Gita. And uh, then in the Gita comes the assurance of divine intervention that uh, when you are in difficulty, the divine help would always be available provided you are open to it. And Sri Aurobindo has given one very important reason why the Gita has a universal appeal and continues to have it even after uh, about 3000 years since it was composed. That's because every scripture, he says, has two parts, one which is perennial in nature, which means which will have some use for people all the time to come. It has everlasting validity. And there is a certain part in the scripture which is rather temporal in nature, which probably had a great importance when the scripture was composed, but with the change of uh, place and the passage of time, uh, it may not uh, 
have that relevance and, uh, and therefore the whole thing may start appearing rather out of date or out of place. But in the Gita, the perennial part is far more than the temporal. So it has something which is of lasting value, which would always remain valid. That part is what constitutes much of the Gita and that is why it has such a universal appeal. Since people turn to it for problems and uh, look for solutions and solace and they invariably always find it, the Gita has perhaps prevented more psychological breakdowns than any psychiatrist or counsellor. There are several people all over the world who have said a lot in praise of the Gita. Here is just one sample, Albert Einstein. When I read the Bhagavad Gita and reflect about how the Divine created this universe, everything else seems so superfluous. Now let's see how the yoga in the Gita is student friendly. Firstly, the path is very flexible, which means that the person can make a beginning with something that is in keeping with the person's uh, inclinations, temperament, capacity and circumstances. Secondly, the emphasis is not on the final goal. In uh, Raja Yoga, for example, there's a lot of emphasis on Samadhi, which is the final goal. And that can be intimidating. The person may feel, well, uh, this is something beyond me. It is perhaps meant only for a select few. But here, the emphasis is not uh, on uh, the final goal, but in fact, the assurance comes from the Divine Himself, or Divine Itself, that uh, every step that you take, helps every bit that you put in, every bit of effort that you pin, put in will bring some returns, nothing will be a waste, even a little effort will not go in vain. And uh, then uh, the Lord does not insist that we be already adequately prepared for uh, the journey on yoga, we are accepted as we are. And uh, all types of devotees, Sri Krishna says, are acceptable to me. and. Uh, Different individuals have been looked upon in terms of three modes of nature, which we call the gunas, and all these, irrespective of how their constitution is in terms of these three modes of nature, are acceptable to the divine. Then, you know, the direction and destination both have been defined. The direction is basically from one mode of nature to the other. What are these three modes? Tamas, which is uh, essentially inertia, rajas, which is uh, activity and sattva which is about love and harmony. So in other words the direction is moving because each one of us has each of these three in us. Uh, the direction is from inertia to activity and from activity to enlightened activity. So that is the direction in which we should be moving. So irrespective of where we are we can start with where we are and move in that direction from inertia towards activity and from activity towards enlightened activity. So the direction has been indicated and the destination, the ultimate destination, the final goal has also been defined. And what is the final goal? Manmanabhava. That would be one way to put at the goal defined by the Gita. Manmanabhava means be my minded. The divine says be my minded, which means let your feelings and thoughts be the same as mine would be. So that is the destination. So that is sort of achieving an identity or union with the divine becoming the same minded as the divine itself. And finally, it is compatible with worldly life. Not only it's compatible with worldly life, there's a lot of emphasis on action. And for action, it is the worldly life that is our platform. And therefore, uh, it is not only compatible, but in fact, there is a lot of emphasis on bringing the teachings into worldly life. So that is how it becomes a very student friendly yoga. It does not uh, uh, emphasize uh, the final goal to an extent that we may feel intimidated. There is a lot of encouragement for anyone to embark on the path of yoga. Since it's such a popular book, one of the most widely translated books in the world, there is no dearth of commentaries on the Gita. But most commentaries tend to be one-sided. Broadly speaking, in the Gita there are three uh, paths uh, indicated the path of action, knowledge and devotion and you can find commentaries which say that the main thing that emphasizes is knowledge. It considers that uh, 
the Gita emphasizes. And the present day tendency is to say that the Gita is a gospel of action. It emphasizes primarily action and uh, that is what it is about. And there could be also a lot of debate whether uh, the Gita favors renunciation of life or getting involved in worldly life. So one can also find in the Gita passages which emphasize renunciation. And uh, therefore, a person depending on his own bias might uh, emphasize, say that the Gita primarily emphasizes action or knowledge or devotion or renunciation or lack of renunciation. And uh, to support the person's uh, own bias, the person can always find an appropriate chapter and verse in the Gita. See, here it is. In this particular verse, this is what the Gita says. But uh, what is important is to try and understand what is it that the Gita as a whole says. Not take one part of it and emphasize what suits us best. And that is perhaps not been done by anybody better than Sri Aurobindo in Essays on the Gita. Essays on the Gita has 48 essays. It was first published as a series of articles in the Arya, a journal that Sri Aurobindo started uh, bringing out in uh, 1914 and which went on till 1920. In uh, these 48 essays, Sri Aurobindo looks at the Gita as a whole in one sweep and tells us that the whole is actually trying to say. And why could Sri Aurobindo do it? And then try and see what it is trying to say. The Gita was a part of Sri Aurobindo's own sadhana. As he says, I mean, you can, can interpret it in any way, but as he says, when he was in prison in uh, uh, Alipur jail in, uh, from 1908 to 1909, the Gita was placed in his hands. And uh, like Arjuna, Sri Aurobindo asked Sri Krishna, what is it that you expect me to do? Continue with the freedom struggle or do something else? So he had a dilemma similar to Arjun had and Sri Krishna not only replied to his questions, he also appeared to him in form. So he had a vision of Sri Krishna, a persistent vision of Sri Krishna going on for a long time, which probably he retained the, all his life in which he could see Sri Krishna in uh, everything animate and inanimate in the prison walls, in the prison bars, in the uh, trees and in the jailers and in the prosecution council, in the defense council, in the bed on which he was sleeping, everywhere he could see Sri Krishna. And he could then have a dialogue with Sri Krishna anytime he wanted during his one year stay in prison. And the voice which he heard kept coming to him again and again at all crucial moments and he learned to trust that voice and follow it without asking any questions. So. Sri Krishna and the Gita were actually a part of Sri Aurobindo's own spiritual experience and therefore he could look at the Gita the way hardly anybody else has done in one sweep looking at the Gita as a whole. So let's now turn a little more to the yoga of the Gita itself and uh, as we learned a while ago Gita is essentially a lesson delivered by the divine in the form of Sri Krishna to a highly accomplished human disciple who was Arjuna and he was in the battlefield. If we look at the sequence of the three paths with which Gita is commonly associated, we can roughly say that the first one third of the Gita emphasizes karma or action, the second one third jnana or knowledge and the last one third bhakti or devotion. Now let's try and understand why that particular sequence. Like a good teacher, Sri Krishna starts with what uh, the disciple already knows something about, what will be simple for the disciple to understand. Arjuna as a person of the warrior class was basically a man of action. And therefore, the most suitable thing to do was to start with action. But then the simple uh, sort of uh, teaching that uh, he should do what his duty is as a person of the warrior class was no longer sufficient to convince him that he should fight. And therefore, going deeper was required. And if going deeper was required, deeper than just the simple teaching that uh, do your duty, which is action, if going deeper was required, more knowledge would be required. So like a good teacher, in the first one third of the Gita itself, 
uh, Sri Krishna not only emphasizes his duty but also throws in a few lines here and there which would arouse the curiosity of the student because you know the student will learn only when the student is interested in learning when the student is curious to learn when the student is thirsty for knowledge and that thirst is created in the first one third itself for example uh, he is told this is one of the most commonly quoted verses of the gita that uh, you have no entitlement to the outcome of the action you are entitled only to act you have a right to act but not to not to insist on a particular type of outcome now when he is told that a person would ordinarily think that well if i am doing something why should i not uh, insist on being successful if nothing else uh, i may not insist on reward and recognition but at least i can uh, expect to be successful if i put in all my heart and soul into the work and i know that i am really good at what i am doing i can at least expect success and insist on it now to understand why even that may be unreasonable what uh, uh, shri krishna does is to put in the very first one third of the gita itself certain things like this which arouse curiosity or that you are not the doer of what you are doing it's only the an ego bewildered person the bewilderment cr created by the ordinary ego which makes a person feel that i am doing something now this goes even further uh, how is it that uh, when i can see that i am doing something i am i am not actually the doer now this arouses curiosity now once the student has become curious in the middle one third of the gita comes knowledge and the pinnacle is reached in chapter 10 or the uh, adhyay 10 as it is called the 10th chapter now here lord krishna tells him that uh, whatever happens in this universe is uh, based on my will so it is the divine will that accomplishes everything uh, everything that happens has the divine will behind it and uh, everything that you see is the divine itself in forms in different forms and that has always been so and will always continue to be so not only in this world but in all the other worlds everything that exists is nothing but the divine itself now that comes in the 10th chapter but then uh, arjun politely says in the 11th chapter all what you have told me i believe in it but then i want to see because the experience is always far more important than knowledge and far more convincing so he says that i want to see i want to experience although i believe in everything that you have said and uh, this is easy to understand for example suppose a person has never tasted anything sweet and this person is told sweetness is a very pleasant taste uh, if you add sugar to any food it becomes sweet and uh, he is also told a few recipes for making sweets the person still may not really know what sweetness is on the other hand if you tell the give the person a sweet and tell him put it in your mouth now tell me how do you feel this is what is called sweetness the person at once knows what sweetness is so when the person has the experience of sweetness he knows but uh, till that has happened no matter how much you tell him about sweetness he doesn't really know what sweetness is so in the 10th chapter he has been told a lot about the divine that the knowledge has been given to him but still arjun is not satisfied he is not convinced and he requests that please give me the experience and what does the divine teacher shri krishna tell him he tells him that with your ordinary eyes you will not be able to experience it so i'll give you the divine eyes divya chakshu i'll give you divine eyes so that you can experience and in the 11th chapter he is given an experience of the divine now arjun is fully convinced now that he is fully convinced and he has the knowledge he suddenly realizes that this person who is in front of me in flesh and blood whom i have been treating as a friend is actually nothing but the divine itself and uh, i have made a mistake in treating him like an ordinary friend and sometimes i have even cracked jokes with him and so on and he asks forgiveness for having uh, treated him like an ordinary human being like an ordinary friend and uh, as a corollary to this knowledge now arjun has become a devotee he is ready to do whatever lord krishna tells him to do he says he feels that well what is the use of my using my limited capacity to think to decide whether or not to fight let me just to 
do what he tells me to do because supreme wisdom is right in front of me i have the privilege of having him in front of me in having him in front of me in flesh and blood why should i waste my energies on trying to think with my limited uh, brain what uh, uh, i should do or what i should not do now that is a devotee a totally surrendered devotee who just places himself in the hands of the lord and is ready to whatever he is told to do so now that arjun has already become a devotee as a result of the knowledge that he has received when in the last one third of the gita the gita emphasizes on devotion it is a lesson for which the disciple is already prepared he has already become a devotee he doesn't have to be told much about what devotion is so that is why this sequence starting with action because that is what the student will understand most easily that is what suits the temperament and uh, the previous knowledge previous learning of the student but then create uh, curiosity also for learning more so when the student has become thirsty for knowledge give him that knowledge and uh, the knowledge that he receives that has as a corollary made him a devotee so now tell him something about devotion so that is why the gita follows this particular sequence but then the sequence is not obligatory a seeker on the path of yoga could follow another sequence suppose a person is more knowledge oriented he starts with knowledge he can get this knowledge from books and uh, when he has got this knowledge like arjun he may also feel curious to experience this knowledge he may go on a personal spiritual quest and experience it and as a result of this knowledge from books and this experience what would happen is that like arjun he may also become a devotee and if he becomes a devotee then uh, he would think what is the use of all this knowledge and devotion if uh, i do nothing for the object of my devotion so then he would start doing something as an offering to the divine whom he worships and adores and uh, therefore automatically from knowledge will follow experiential knowledge becoming a devotee and doing something for the lord so action would follow so after knowledge would come devotion and from after knowledge and devotion would come action so all three would automatically come in suppose there is another person who is more devotion oriented and that is how many of our spiritual masters have actually been they were not men of great learning they were not warriors not men of action and uh, what they started with was simple devotion in a way devotion is the simplest thing to start with because it requires no other qualification i am yours that's all we have to tell the lord do with me what you want and totally placing oneself in the hands of the lord of course i mean this can sometimes be uh seen as something very passive and it can also a person who is very passive can also sort of take refuge that well this is also acceptable because i am on the path of devotion but then uh, true devotion is not easy because true devotion requires the type of surrender that a lazy person who just uh, sort of tries to pretend as if he is a devotee that lazy person will not be able to come up with that the type of total surrender which actually is required on the path of devotion but then uh, there have been genuine devotees who have placed themselves entirely in the hands of the lord and uh, there are several examples uh, just to quote uh, cite a few of them uh, guru nanak mirabai tulsidas surdas sri ramakrishna so many of these devotees started with devotion and uh, what was the result they got experiential knowledge they could see the divine they could see the divine experience the divine purely as a result of this total devotion and when they experienced the divine some of them decided to describe their experience in words and they got the words also from the divine that is how mantras are created so they wrote down what the words that they received to describe their experience and what they wrote down became a scripture so these people who started with devotion did not have to read any scriptures they created scriptures and uh, once uh, they having started with devotion they had the knowledge 
And they would also say that, well, what is the use of this uh, devotion and knowledge if I do nothing for the object of my devotion? So action would come in. So they may start with devotion, but then that would be followed by knowledge and action, which means that once again, all the three parts, so-called three parts of the Gita would merge into one. And uh, how would they act? Some of them have acted. Some of the devotees who got this experiential knowledge created scriptures. How have they uh, translated, uh, sort of also acted by coming back to the ordinary world and helping others walk on the spiritual path? Say, uh, Lord Buddha, he was uh, in seclusion as a devotee in search of knowledge and uh, when he got the knowledge, he came back to the world. So he started with curiosity, got the experience, came back. So many of them have come back to the world to teach and that has been their action. So no matter how one starts, whether one starts with action as happens in the Gita or starts with knowledge or starts with devotion, if the person walks on the path long enough and sincerely enough, eventually the person will be practicing all the three and therefore the triune is not three independent paths, in fact the triune is one. The division between these three paths is primarily for the convenience of the student. Because the Yoga of the Gita is very student friendly, it gives the student a choice, a freedom to start on any one of the three paths, depending upon the inclinations, the temperament, the capacity and the circumstances of the student, the person can start on any of the three, but then if he walks on any of the three long enough and sincerely enough, the person would eventually be walking all the three paths, the three would merge into one and one way to express that merger would be to say that the triune meets when action is enlightened by knowledge and lubricated by devotion. This lubrication by devotion one can understand in a very elegant expression used by the mother in one of her prayers, in thy love that's the love of the divine, is peace, in thy love is joy, in thy love is thy servitor's sovereign lever of work. So the devotee becomes a servitor of the divine, is ready to do whatever the divine expects of the person and the person is able to do that work properly because this love of the divine, the devotion, works as a lever. Lever, you know, magnifies our effort. A little effort translates into a great effect. That is what a lever is about. So it's a very elegant expression. Uh, that thy love, that is the devotion to you, devotion to the Lord, is thy servitors. That is me as a servitor. It is uh, my lever of work. So that's how, you know, it lubricates work. Devotion lubricates work. It magnifies the work, it magnifies the uh, effect of the work because the devotion works like a lever of work. You know, the person is charged with that devotion. So a person who is charged into a mission mode, you know, he has a mission to accomplish. So when the person is charged like that, then the person can do a lot more. And that person gets charged only if the person is devoted. Knowledge will not do it. Knowledge is too sterile. To be able to accomplish this type of uh, dedication and passion. The dedication, passion and commitment comes from devotion. So that is the positive side of emotions. Emotions are not there just to lead us astray. Emotions are a great collaborator on the, on the path of yoga and uh, on the path of yoga the emotions translate into devotion, love for the divine, love exclusively for the divine, and uh, devotion by devotion is expressed by working for the divine with great joy peacefully so peace joy and effective action that is what love of the lord leads to so in thy love is peace in thy love is joy in thy love is thy servitor sovereign lever of work Now let's spend a little time on Gita in relation to action. Because the modern tendency is to say that the Gita is basically a gospel of action and therefore let's try and understand a little more in detail what actually the Gita is about action. When it comes to 
action or work in the gita there is a developing argument the first element of this developing argument is that renounce the fruit one of the most widely quoted verses of the gita karmanye vadhikar aste ma phaleshu kadachana that is you have an adhikara on the work but not on the outcome or the fruit of the work now, now adhikara does not mean right although that is how it's commonly translated if one were to find a near equivalent in the english language it is entitlement you are entitled to act now in what is entitlement entitlement is a little different from right entitlement means that you are equipped for it you are fit for it now for example after getting a degree from medical school a person is entitled to practice medicine because now he is considered fit to practice medicine he has got the necessary knowledge he has passed the necessary exams so that is entitlement so as a human being you are entitled to action which means that much qualification that much of ability you have it doesn't just mean right that is adhikara so you are entitled to action but not to its fruit or to its outcome and uh, why so because you are not the doer and there that comes the next argument that you should renounce this feeling that i am the doer so it is a developing argument first renounce the fruit don't insist on the fruit now this part is important don't insist on the fruit because a common misunderstanding is do not expect the fruit you see if an intelligent person puts in a certain work there is a certain expectation he has that action a will lead to result b so that result b is an expectation that is not what has been told by the gita do not uh, ask for it do not be attached to it the gita says which means you can expect it but you do not be attached to it and not being attached means you will not insist upon it you will not insist upon it because you are not entitled to insist upon it now that can happen only if i am actually not doing something i am working as somebody's instrument and whose instrument i am the instrument of the divine so you renounce this feeling that i am the doer so he told you are not the doer it's only a person bewildered by the ego ahankara vimud atma that is the person who has been bewildered by the ego who thinks that i am the doer actually you are not the doer and this comes within the one third of the gita creates more curiosity now what is the next rung of the argument you renounce i me and minus which means not only you are not the doer you renounce this feeling itself the of i me and minus nirmamo nirahankara nirmamo not mine nirahankara minus hmm? this feeling that i am a distinct individual so renounce i me and minus dissolve the ego completely merge with the larger reality of which you are a part so you are able to identify yourself with that larger reality of a part only if you forget only if you renounce your little self which center which is centered around the ego and the ego essentially is i me and minus so it's a developing argument first renounce the fruit then renounce the feeling that i am doing it and then renounce yourself as your little self just merge with that larger identity so that's a developing argument now how does it then translate into the work that we do firstly the work should be done as an instrument of the divine not as the doer but as an instrument of the divine and considering that it's my privilege to have been chosen as the instrument the lord krishna tells arjun in the 11th chapter itself in the later part after giving him all that experience that uh, i have already decided that the kauravas that is your opponents in the war have to die you only be an instrument to carry this out you be the channel for carrying out what i have already decided so you are just a channel to give an expression to my decision to my will and uh, why have you been chosen as an instrument because you are dear to me i want that you should win the glory of uh, 
and you should uh, earn the glory of having won a war. Hmm? You should yesho labhaswa, and you should enjoy a pros prosperous kingdom, bhunkaksha rajya samridham. You should enjoy a prosperous kingdom. I want all this should happen to you because you are dear to me and that is why I have chosen you as an instrument to do what has already been decided by me. Then, because you are not the doer, you should have no attachment to the outcome. Do not be attached to the outcome. The outcome is in my hands. I have already decided it. So, you may expect a certain outcome but don't insist on it. And you will not insist on it only if you are not attached to it. Further, do not be even attached to the work. Now this is again very important because in ordinary life we feel, well I may not insist on the outcome, but at least I enjoy my work and therefore we get attached to the work itself. If that work is denied to us, taken away from us, once again we are uncomfortable. And uh, it's not only an ordinary person, who dreads retirement because he thinks after retirement I will not have the work to do that I enjoy. But uh, even great men like Mahatma Gandhi have experienced it. Once Mahatma Gandhi was in quarantine and now during the COVID pandemic we can all understand what quarantine is. He was in quarantine for some infectious disease and one of the things that made him most uncomfortable was that he could not do his everyday work. He was enjoying the work and then that is when he realized what attachment to work can be. So have no attachment to the work. Till the Lord expects me to be doing this work, I'll go on doing it. When he doesn't expect it, I'm ready to withdraw myself because the Lord has no scarcity of instruments. The Lord's work always goes on. The instruments are always available. Till he wants me to be an instrument, it is my privilege and therefore I'll put, an, put my heart and soul into the work. But when he is not expecting it from me, the work has been taken away from me, I'm happy with that also. So no attachment to the work. So these are some of the basic things which Gita talks about or on the basis of the Gita we can say, the Gita says about action. So just sort of saying that the basic uh, teaching of the Gita is perform your duty in a disinterested manner. Karmanevadhikaraste maafaleshu kadachana That is you, you can work but you don't have the right to the outcome. Now that is a very simplistic type of an interpretation of the Gita in relation to action. Then you know, offer this work to the divine. Now what is an offering? An offering is the result of love. So it is not a result of all that rational thinking that I am not an instrument, therefore uh, I should not insist on the outcome, I should not be attached to the work and so on. In addition, there is work based being done in a spirit of devotion. Devotion is the lever, you know, as the mother said. So once one does it out of devotion, one enjoys the work and uh, one does the work in the best possible way, as well as one can, putting one's heart and soul into it because it has to be made fit as an offering. It becomes fit and as an offering only if I do it in the best way I can. So offer the work to the divine. Because this is again very important because uh, very often it is thought if uh, uh, the outcome is not in my hands, the outcome will be in any case what has already been decided, then I can do the work in a perfunctory manner and uh, in any case the outcome has already been ensured. But that is not what it means. If I have been chosen as an instrument, it is my privilege because the divine has no shortage of instruments, still he has chosen me, so it's a privilege and I am devoted to the divine. I adore the divine and therefore the work should be done in the best possible way and then offered to the divine. So that is essentially the spirit behind the word offering the work to the divine. And that can be a great joy. Here comes Chirabindo talking about the joy of uh, being the servitor of the div uh, divine. The servitudes on earth are greater king. King you know here stands for the divine. The servitudes on earth are greater king than all the glorious liberties of heaven. So in heaven there might be promise of freedom and liberty and so on, but much more joy is there in being your servant on this earth. Thy servitudes on earth are greater king than all the glorious liberties of heaven. Another thing that the Gita talks about is 
what type of action is suitable for a person swabhava and swadharma these are two basic concepts which occur in the gita swabhava means what is in keeping with the basic temperament or of the person and that is determined primarily by the balance or you can see the proportion in which the three modes of nature tamas rajas and sattva that is inertia activity and enlightened activity or enlightenment or you can say uh, knowledge and harmony so uh, to what extent these three elements are present in the person determine what type of work the person is best suited for for example a person of the warrior class the virgin was would have a considerable amount of rajas that is activity activity passion desires you know, that is rajas would have but at the same time a good kshatriya the way arjun was would also have a considerable amount of sattva that is principle of knowledge and harmony and it was because of this sattva that uh, he felt that i should not fight this war because uh, he was a highly ethical person and was uh, uh, had a lot of this consideration of right and wrong which comes from sattva so he had that so swabhava determines what type of work the person is uh, suitable for and a person of the warrior class and also uh, top administrators and leaders uh, should have a combination of this rajas which will make them active and charge them with that energy which is required for continuous activity and uh, so on but that should be tempered by ethical considerations which will come from sattva so that is swabhava but so each person swabhava is different psychological constitution dependent upon these three modes of nature is different so different types of work suit different people now what is swadharma swabhava remaining the same what a person actually does is also determined by what the person is expected to do in those particular circumstances so the circumstances determine the swadharma of that individual so arjuna had the basic uh, uh, temperament of a warrior warrior or a kshatriya but then his swadharma in that particular battlefield was to fight because those were the circumstances which determined what he should do in those particular circumstances and uh, having considered both the swabhava and swadharma so as you know mind or of the person bhava is the feelings so that determines the temperament and dharma is sense of right and wrong so dharma that is for me what is right and wrong now one having considered the swabhava and swadharma and decided what should be done the person should work without preferences here you know arjuna was showing a preference for not fighting so that preference should be taken away once this is the right thing for me to do i should just do it and if i am denied the opportunity to do it i should not do it uh, which means that i should not have attachment to the work so without any preferences having now this sometimes make a makes a person you know again feel that uh, this is my swabhava and uh, in swadharma and therefore i uh, can do this and for that the person starts showing a preference to give you a simple example suppose a person feels that i am a very compassionate person and therefore i am fit to be a doctor so he works towards the career of a doctor now this person fails to get into medical school now if the person says i can't do anything else uh, for me the world has come to an end because i now i can't become a doctor and that is what i am made for so it is not in keeping of with my swabhava to do anything else now this is a preference based on an egoistic consideration because there is no dearth of opportunities for a compassionate person to express his compassion even without being a doctor he can become a nurse he can become a counselor he can become a physiotherapist or no matter what he ends up becoming there will always be room for compassion so compassion is not possible only by becoming a doctor the per- the reason why the person is so upset as failing to get into medical school is because of egoistic considerations because he thinks that uh, being a doctor for- provides the best opportunity for combining service to humanity with a good income so it is that combination which is a preference which is making him uncomfortable not just the fact that he has lost an opportunity to express his compassion so swabhava and swadharma but without preferences 
Now we talk so far primarily upon how to do the duty or how to do the action, how to work. Now, even more important than that is uh, which duty. So far the emphasis has been on how to do one's duty and that is what is commonly talked about that is perform the duty in a disinterested manner. Disinterested means without considerations of personal gain and loss. Well, this is something which is ordinary common sense. How to do one's duty? Do it without, do it because it is your duty. No, do not think about what you will gain or lose because of doing your duty. So without any consideration of gain and loss, which means at least irrespective of gain and loss, don't think in terms of uh, what I will get out of it and therefore in return for what I will get, how much work I should put in. Don't think of that. Do your duty to the best of your ability without thinking about personal gain and loss. This is something which is good, but uh, it does not require a scripture of the depth of the Gita just to tell that much. If the Gita had to say just that much, that is uh, perform your duty in a disinterested manner. If that is all the Gita had to say, the Gita could have finished in the second chapter. That comes in the second chapter. Why are the other 16 chapters necessary? The other 16 chapters became necessary for various reasons, some of which we have touched upon. But one important reason why those 16 chapters were necessary was that not only the Gita tells us uh, how to do one's duty, but even more important, it tells us which duty. Which duty to perform? Because various duties can be in conflict. The same person can have a variety of duties coming into conflict with one another. Social duty, patriotic duty, moral duty, domestic duty, which duty? Now, this is the type of dilemmas which not only Arjun had, Arjun had the conflict between his duty as a person of the warrior class, as a Kshatriya, on one hand, and his duty as a morally sentient being who wanted to live a life along ethical lines and he thought that a non-violent life would be ethical, violence of any type would be unethical. So this is what created that dilemma for him, uh, whether or not to fight. So he was a conflict between these two duties, duty as a, a person of the warrior class and duty as a morally conscious person. Now this type of dilemmas were not restricted to Arjun. People have experienced them repeatedly and we continue to experience them now. Uh, just to give you one example from history, uh, there was a diplomat called Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat, posted in Lithuania during the Second World War. And one day, he woke up to a lot of noise outside the embassy and he was told that thousands of Jews have come there. Uh, they have escaped Germany. Uh, they wanted to escape because they knew if they continued to live there, they would be executed by Hitler. And these people want a visa for going to Japan because they think Japan will be a safe place to go to. Now this person thought that if I do not give them visas, they are sure to die. They will probably forced back to go back to Germany and uh, even some other parts of Europe will soon be invaded by Hitler and these Jews will die. On the other hand, uh, to give thousands of visas all at once and that too to people who will go and become refugees in Japan was not an easy decision to take. As a government servant, in fact, he would be expected not to do it. So he sent a message to his government with whatever means were available those days, telex messages and so on. So he sent a message to his government telling them that this is the situation, what should I do? As expected, immediately came the answer, don't give visas. Second time, same answer. The third time, same answer, no visas. So thrice his government told him no visas. But then yet he thought that if I don't give them the visas, then these people will die. So violating the orders that he had received, he started giving the visas. Now here again there was a conflict, a conflict between what his official duty was. His official duty was to do what his government tells him to do. But somewhere deep within told him that this, is not, this will not be the right thing to do. So it was his inner voice, his conscience, if you may call it so which told him give the visas and he preferred to listen to that. So 
conflict between two duties and this is what he decided to do. He gave thousands of visas. Then came the order from his country, come back to Japan. He boarded the train to leave and then the people followed him to the platform and the visa forms were all finished. He started signing on blank sheets of paper and started handing them over to people on the platform quickly in great hurry to sign as many of those blank sheets as possible. These people managed to reach Japan. These visas were honored and they saved their lives. But then this person Sugihara had to face the music when he went back. His government naturally didn't treat him very kindly. But then he was prepared for that. So this type of conflict between duties occurs in everybody's life, maybe not on that scale as was the case with Arjuna or with Sugihara, but say an ordinary woman, a working woman, maybe she's a doctor or a nurse and uh, she knows that if she does not go to the hospital, the patients will suffer, they are waiting for her. On the other hand, at home she has a child who is not well, the child insists, please don't go today. Now what should she do? So conflict between the duty to her child and duty to all the patients who are waiting for her. So this is where the Gita tells us which duty. So out of all these different types of duties which may come in conflict, family duty, social duty, moral duty, patriotic duty and so on, uh, which of these duties one should actually do? That is what the Gita tells us because that was Arjun's problem. Arjun knew quite well how to do his duty. That he knew as a Kshatriya who was well versed in the scriptures of those days. Whatever moral codes were prevalent those days, he knew that, how to do his duty. His dilemma was which duty out of the two, as a warrior or as a morally conscious person. And that is the guidance that comes from the Gita, which can be generalized to the life of each one of us when it comes to action, work that we should do, then when there is a conflict between duties, which duty? The duty that we should choose is divine duty. So more important than all these, moral, social and patriotic and so on, an official duty is divine duty. So one of these would be the divine duty. So which one of these is the divine duty? How to know that? That answer actually comes in the 18th chapter of the Gita. And that is in a way the Mahavakya, that is the greatest utterance of the Gita towards the end of the Gita, in the last chapter. 18th chapter. Karmani eva adhikaraste ma phaleshu. Sorry, no, sorry, sorry. I started reciting that one. Sarva dharman paritajya ma phale. Sarva dharman paritajya ma me kam sharanam vraja. Hmm? So that is the Sarva dharman paritajya. Abandon all dharmas. Ma me kam sharanam vraja. Take refuge in me alone. Now, abandon all dharmas. Dharmas, you know, dharma here means sense of right and wrong. Abandon all of them. Forget all of them. Now, looks very strange. A scripture telling somebody, forget all those considerations of right and wrong that you are aware of. What it means is that all the written ethical codes, all the codes of right and wrong that you have studied so far, forget all of them. Abandon all of them. But then do instead what? Mame kam charanam raja. Take refuge in me alone. Sri Krishna is telling Arjun, take refuge in me instead of thinking about what all you have studied in all the scriptures about what one should do and one should not do. Abandon all of them, forget all of them. Now this is such a unexpected type of a statement in a scripture that people are sometimes even afraid to translate it properly. And they go beat about the bush and try it this way, that way and so on, you know, uh, and so on. But this is exactly what the verse says. Sarva dharman paritajya mame kam charanam raja. Give up all of them. Forget all of them. Abandon all of them. Abund ignore all the considerations of right and wrong that you have studied so far. Instead, take refuge in me. Now, what does taking refuge in the divine mean? Taking refuge in the divine means... Listen to me, do what I am telling you to do. Now, Arjun had the good fortune of having Krishna in front of him in flesh and blood. 
How about we ordinary persons who do not have that fortune? Whom should we ask? We don't have Sri Krishna standing in front of us to tell us what to do. But we have that Krishna within. We have the divine within us. And that divine voice does speak maybe in a faint whisper. And that is our psychic being. That is what Sri Aurobindo and the mother call the psychic being. That is uh, the dynamic aspect of the soul. That is what tells us what the divine duty is. That is what we should do. We should do what our psychic being tells us to do. So that is how we know what the divine duty is. So the Gita is primarily about which duty rather than how the duty should be done. So as you can see we have moved while talking about the different schools of yoga from the instrument to application. Preparing the instrument, the body-mind complex, is what we can do by using the techniques available in Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga to up to a modest degree, not going necessarily all the way so that the application of, sorry, so that the perfection of the instrument itself ends up taking uh, all the 24 hours of the day, not going to that extent, but uh, in moderation, using those techniques to uh, make the body-mind complex a better instrument, a more efficient instrument, and then the Gita is guiding us on how to apply, or rather how to use that instrument, how to put that instrument to good use. That is what the Gita is about. And uh, this has been given again very beautifully by the mother in a very simple uh, prayer. Grant that I may do as well as I can the best thing to do. Very simple but a very profound prayer. A prayer worth keeping uh, in mind, committing to memory, keeping it at a few places in the house where you can see it. What is the prayer? The simple prayer? I may do as well as I can. The prayer to the Lord is, help me do as well as I can. Not as well as possible. I may not be able to do that work in the best possible way, but at least I should do it as well as I can, as well as my abilities allow. Grant that I may do as well as I can, not necessarily as well as possible, but as well as I can. What should I do in the best, sorry, in the best way I can? What should I do in the best way I can? The best thing to do. Again, very important. What should I do in the best way I can? The best thing to do. And who will tell me what the best thing to do is? The divine within. The psychic being. Grant that I may do as well as I can the best thing to do. And here's another uh, one from the mother about the Gita. Sri Aurobindo considers the message of the Gita to be the basis of the great spiritual movement which has led and will lead humanity more and more to its liberation, that is to say, to its escape from falsehood and ignorance towards the truth. So there's a genuine liberation of the world, of the human race, from falsehood and ignorance, because uh, that is what dominates the human consciousness. Very limited knowledge is not only ignorance, but can also be falsehood because uh, it can convince us about something which is not true. From there to move towards the truth is a type of liberation, liberation from ignorance and falsehood and uh, that is what the Gita has been doing for a long time and will continue to do. That is what the Sri Aurobindo thought of the Gita and the mother has told us that. Now let's go to a few questions. Bhakti or devotion is a path of yoga that is simple, easy, efficient, a shortcut. Let's start with B. It looks easy, but uh, devotion is not easy. Total surrender is not easy. It may look efficient. That is, it uh, it take us there quickly. It is not quick either. It's a shortcut 
again looks quick but it is not quick all what it is it is simple there's a difference between being simple and easy it is not easy but it is simple because it requires no essential qualification not great intelligence and uh, manojda used to give an example to illustrate that from the ramayana in the ramayana you know hanuman is an epitome of de uh, devotion and uh, he also the hanuman also uh, becomes one with the divine one with rama who was an incarnation of the divine like shri krishna so but hanu what is the outer form of hanuman that of a monkey so manojda used to say that uh, if uh, a devotee is perfect if our devotion is perfect then even a monkey can reach god so for a devotee a perfect devotee the imperfections of the devotee do not matter so that is the simplicity of so the path of devotion or bhakti is simple although it may not be necessarily easy efficient or a shortcut however having said that this next question brings out one more thing maximum personal effort is required on the path of action knowledge devotion all of the above three require the same degree of personal effort now yoga progress is the result of uh, personal effort and divine grace now which of these requires more of personal effort to win the grace to earn the grace one can put it something like this that uh, on the path of uh, knowledge the person has to walk 90% of the path to complete the remaining 10% through divine grace why because a person who takes to the path of knowledge and is highly knowledge oriented is also likely to have a lot of skepticism doubts questions and so on which will keep acting as an obstacle for a long time he'll keep getting into uh, hair splitting details unnecessary analysis and the result will be that his progress slows down it takes him much longer to earn the grace that is necessary so 90% of the path he himself has to cover through personal effort in case of action especially if the action is enlightened by knowledge and uh, lubricated by devotion the person has to walk 50% of the path and the remaining 50% the divine will walk towards him with grace so he has to take five steps the divine will take another five steps towards him to complete 10 steps that may be necessary on the path of devotion on the other hand the person has to make a beginning if the person right from the beginning is a total devotee he has to walk only 10% of the path and the remaining 90% the divine will take for him through grace so that way maximum personal effort is actually required on the path of knowledge so that's not easy but all the same it is simple because he just has to make a beginning with total devotion total surrender and the, the divine grace will be earned and the person will be uh, will reach the point of perfection so the correct answer is that maximum personal effort is required on the path of knowledge because of the doubts and questions which this person might have is an assertion reason type of question the gita is a gospel of action <clears throat> is the reason given is the gita starts with emphasis on action the gita does start with emphasis on action but that is because like a good teacher shri krishna starts with what the student uh, is best prepared to receive uh but that doesn't make the gita essentially a gospel of action it talks of action knowledge and devotion all three and eventually shows how the three can merge into one so assertion is a false statement it is not really a gospel of action as is the common tendency to look upon these days uh, so it's not a true statement the assertion is a false statement reason is a true statement it does start with emphasis on action then the gita starts with uh, uh, next questions the here the assertion is the gita starts with emphasis on action which is true and the reason given is arjuna was an action oriented person yes the student here was 
an action oriented person and that is why it starts with action so the assertion is a true statement reason is a true statement and the reason is a correct explanation for the assertion another question assertion in yoga the path of devotion needs much less personal effort than the path of knowledge that we have discussed uh, already uh, does need the path of devotion does need much less uh, personal effort the reason given is devotion needs neither great intelligence nor educational qualifications now that is not the true reason the true reason is it earns divine grace quickly because this person doesn't have the type of doubts and questions this person is a simple person it's a simplicity not that uh, an intelligent person if he is totally devoted he also will need less personal effort so it's not intelligence itself which comes in the way or educational qualifications which come in the way so assertion is a true statement reason is also a true statement because great intelligence and education qualifications are not necessary but reason is not a correct explanation for the assertion do what the krishna within says can be a dangerous doctrine now this is also true uh why it can be dangerous is because the person can reason gets very easy to mistake the voice of the ego for the voice of krishna this can happen because the person says lord krishna himself has says mame kam sharanam vraja i have taken refuge in the divine and therefore now i am entitled to do what i think lord krishna is telling me to do but it's not actually lord krishna telling him to do the voice of the ego can be easily mistaken for the voice of krishna so that's why it's a dangerous doctrine but then why does the divine say it shri krishna says it in chapter 18 till at least the chapter 16 he tells uh, uh, arjun follow the shastra what is shastra written codes of conduct so the ethical codes which are written are a safer guide for the common man it's only when the person has reached the stage which arjun had reached by the 18th chapter that the person is qualified to use that freedom given in the 18th chapter abandon all dharmas so to forget all of them abandon all of them that freedom comes only in the 18th chapter towards the end of the gita so that till the person is not qualified for that the best guide for that person the safest guide for that person still are the written codes of conduct <coughs> so assertion is a true statement do what the krishna within says can be a dangerous doctrine it can be dangerous why because of the reason given it is very easy to mistake the voice of the ego for the voice of krishna so the reason is a correct explanation for the assertion uh the yoga of the gita is the fourth chapter in this book a primer on yoga in the synthesis of yoga in fact the yoga of the gita is there at many places uh, because uh, integral yoga the synthesis does lean very heavily on the yoga of the gita but two major places where it comes are uh, in the introductory section in chapter 4 and in part 3 the first chapter love and the triple path shorbindo calls the yoga of the gita very often the triple path and of course the essays on the gita which is not just a commentary on the gita but another gita in itself and uh, there are some compilations like this in which uh, uh, you have the original verse of the gita in sanskrit a translation into english by sri aurobindo and then some suitable passages taken from the essays on the gita or other works of sri aurobindo which are quite relevant to that particular verse of the gita one of those compilations called the message of the gita uh, is uh, by anil baran roy there are a few more also of the same type then you know in the uh, magazine published by the shorbindo ashram delhi branch the call beyond it's a monthly online uh, the january issue focused on the essays on the gita in fact the plan is that uh, throughout this 12 months of the year 2022 which is uh, the 150th birth anniversary year of sri aurobindo each issue will focus on one major work of sri aurobindo so called major work of course all works are major one work of sri aurobindo 
So the January issue focused on the essays on the Gita. You can get some glimpses of the essays on the Gita from this issue of the Call Beyond. And in this book, Spiritual Wisdom in Small Doses, which is available for free download on the Yes Spirituality website, you'll find essays on the, sorry, short essays on the topics which we have talked about today, like Gita, the Gunas, Rajas, Sattva and Tamas, action, devotion and knowledge. On each one of these, you'll find a separate essay. And of course, questions and comments are always welcome by email on essay150yes at gmail.com. Gratitude to the mother and the master for uh, the success of today's session and the program that we are having. Thank you. Yes, if you have any questions, we can go for questions. Yes, uh, Rachna. Uh, namaste. So, very nicely explained about Bhagavad Gita. One question is here, sir. I would like to ask, uh, like, without expecting the fruit, we have to do karma, right? But for a new beginner who's into part of this, always when they do some action, they always say, Agar hum padenge to pass hoenge. You know, they always ask for a action. So how you should control? For a beginner, that's just for a beginner. In fact, I made that little distinction between expecting an outcome and insisting on an outcome. To expect an outcome is legitimate. But uh, to insist on an outcome is what the Gita says one should not do. It's only when we are attached to the fruit that we insist on it. So if a person uh, is working hard with the expectation of uh, uh, doing well in an exam, that expectation is not something that uh, is being denied by the Gita. Expectation is valid, attachment is not. And how does it help us? The way it helps us is that uh, it uh, gives us peace irrespective of what happens. We are prepared for everything. Hope for the best, as I say in ordinary language, hope for the best, be prepared for the worst. So that actually is given uh, not only uh, validity, but also a spiritual explanation and a spiritual foundation in the Gita. It will become more clear when we go further into these details uh, in uh, the next module, which next module means in this course itself, when we start talking about the spiritual worldview and the purpose of life. Thank you, sir. Very nicely what you have explained. So the basic crux you have explained in very nice, simple terms. Thank you. Aditi, if there are no more questions, then I think we can go towards the end no. of the session. The presentation just, was rather long today. No, there's just one more question. By I think Arun has raised his hand. Maybe if you can sure. ask Arun. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. I actually ye baat karna cha raha tha ki aapka session mein shuru se le raha hu aur mujhe bahut bahut acha laga hai. Iske liye aapko dhanne baad mujhe kafi kuch chizhe samajh mein aane lagi hai. लेकिन मैं ये सोचता हूँ क्या संभव है कि ये हिंदी में हो ताकि और मेरे जैसे और लोग भी इसको और अच्छे से देख सकें और सुन सकें समझ सकें जी अगर श्रीमा की इच्छा होगी तो कभी हिंदी में भी होगा लेकिन इस सेशन इस कोर्स को तो हमने शुरू से अनाउंस किया था कि अंग्रेजी में ही होगा दी क्वेश्चन वॉज वेदर दी सेशन कैन बी हेल्ड इन हिंदी Uh, you said, I mean, this particular program, right from the beginning, we had announced will be in English, and we are catering to an international audience. And uh, 
therefore i'm sorry these sessions will not be possible in hindi but uh, the mother willing maybe in future we can sometimes hold uh, another course similar course in hindi uh, of course in india again uh, everybody doesn't understand hindi but uh, you're quite right i mean uh, uh, much larger number of indians would understand it better if it were held in hindi but uh, in this particular course the intention was to cater to an international audience okay sir bilkul main sahmat hu aapki baat se aur mujhe koi dikkat nahi hai ki is is session ko angrezi mein hi chalaya jaye pura aur in fact iske baad aur dusre bhi courses aap karne wale hain uske wo bhi angrezi mein ho wo koi dikkat nahi hai par agar sambhavna hogi to hindi mein bhi aayega to aur log bhi isko dekh paayenge thank you sir thank you all right i think with that uh, we come to the end of today's session the next session will be on monday we end with the music as always thank you for joining thank you so much ध्यान के देश में
रही बांसुरी ज्ञान के लोक में चेतना चल पड़ी देव्य आलोक में नील नभ के नखत ये तुम्हारे चरण सुखरे ओम तक सत तुम्हारे चरण जागरण को जगा दे सवेरा है तू आंख दे चित्र मन पर चितेरा है तू जागरण को जगा दे सवेरा है तू आंख दे चित्र मन पर चितेरा है तू के सारथी कल्प के देवता देव अरविंद है आत्मा के पिता सत्य के सारथी कल्प के देवता देव अरविंद है आत्मा के पिता दो बलिए तुम्हारे चरण दो सुनहले कवलिए तुम्हारे चरण सिंधु के संतरण ये तुम्हारे चरण छंद के दो चरण ये तुम्हारे चरण अंबर तलक ये तुम्हारे चरण दो सुधा के चशक ये तुम्हारे चरण नील नभ के नखत ये तुम्हारे चरण सुख भरे ओम तत्स तुम्हारे चरण मेरे जीवन के धन दो अनूठे रतन ये तुम्हारे चरण मेरे जीवन